Good to see me, isn't it? No need to respond. That was rhetorical. That's the first line of Wicked, by the way, if you didn't know. Also, as you can see, because I can't do up the back of my dress because of all the buttons, I'm not wearing a bra. So consider that your bribe to subscribe. Now I'm going to promptly get changed because I am sweating so hard. Whoa, what a transition. That intro was from when I originally recorded this over a month ago. I've been editing it and animating it, and upon completing the first 10 minutes of the animation and just general editing, I realized that it didn't make any sense whatsoever. So here we are again. It's not my hyperfixation anymore, so I really don't care, but it's taken me so long to do this video. If I don't do it, I literally will have wasted two months of my life. Hi, editing me here. Um, I'm currently diseased. That's why my voice sounds really good right now. I just needed to come on here really quickly and issue a public apology for the first 10 minutes of this video because my lipstick is actually a crime against humanity, uh, a war crime, if you will. Uh, I'm so sorry. This is my official YouTuber apology. I have, it goes away after 10 minutes. So just don't look at it or put it on full screen. So here is my original intro. Hello, I'm Joe, and I grew up a theatre kid, which means I only just saw this clip of Katy Perry performing Bon Appetit on SNL six years ago. That makes me want to hit a dab and do the floss. And this video is going to go just fine the second time round. And this is a show I like to call... Floss! Keeping me up at night. A show where I talk about what keeps me up at night. And what's keeping me up at night is having to refilm this two and a half hour video. And also Wicked, the musical. You know what Wicked the musical is. I told you last month when I filmed this video for the first time. It's the origin story of the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. The musical's long-awaited movie adaptation, which has been cancelled multiple times and has allegedly ruined multiple people's lives, finally has a release date for parts one and a general idea about Part two. And part one comes out less than a year from now. So I thought it was high time I properly revisited one of my favorite musicals. However, I have never actually read the book that it's based on, Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West by Gregory Maguire, until now. And let me tell you, this was not the musical. This was not the musical at all. I didn't know that adaptations were allowed to be this loose. A few trigger warnings here. Date, R word, which unfortunately might rhyme with a fruit. It's not safe for work content. Some might say a bit sensual, if, if you catch my drift. And of course, general death and general violence, which was not what I was expecting from the book that spawned the generally family-friendly musical. The musical is uplifting, fun, makes me cry for good reasons. While the novel is dark, has an interspecies orgy and makes me cry for bad reasons. Personally, my Goodreads rating was only three stars. I really thought it was gonna be a slightly more complex version of the musical, but apparently I'm a fucking idiot. While there is some stuff that does overlap, a lot of stuff doesn't. Making a musical out of this source material would have been a bit of a challenge. So I thought it would be fun to contrast and compare the story beats of both the musical and the novel. So unfortunately, that does mean I will not be touching upon the magical interspecies orgy. So feel free to explore that one in your own time. Also, just to preface how unprepared for this book I was, I had just finished the last Akatar book the day before I started this, and I was not prepared or warned for the content in that book. So going from reading passages like that to reading passages like all through the rest of the scene, he was off to one side, yammering away to some peasants who were busy screwing each other on the ground before him, hacking each other to pieces and eating their sexual parts, which ran with a real gravy. You could smell the garlic and the sautéed mushrooms. That jarred the heck out of me. Color me jarred. I'm a jar of jam at this point. Also, also I, cannot I cannot get hydrated at all. Ew. Ew. Alrighty, let's get started, finally. Alright, first things first. The Wicked Witch of the West's government name is Elphaba Throp. And if you didn't know that, you're probably a normal person and haven't seen the musical. So I will be referring to the Wicked Witch of the West as Elphaba Throp. Elphaba Throp. Yes. Let's start somewhere fun, like Elphaba's conception. In the musical, we find out that Elphaba was born out of infidelity. Her mother had an affair with a stranger who kept giving her sips from a little green bottle while her husband was away. Thus, Elphaba comes out green. 
The next child, Nessa Rose, Elphaba's sister, comes early with her legs tangled because their father fed their mother too many, oh my god, I'm in pain, too many milk flowers to try and keep the baby's skin from being green. Unfortunately, this kills their mother during birth and Nessa has to use a wheelchair as a result of her coming early. And their father blames everything on Elphaba because he is a victim of the patriarchy and refuses to go to therapy to deal with his grief or take responsibility for his actions. A rough and complicated upbringing for the Wicked Witch of the West in the musical, but not as rough and complicated as the book. Not at all. I can see why they couldn't put this family dynamic into a light-hearted show tune. Elphaba's mother, Molina, is left alone for many weeks out of the year because her husband and minister, Frex the Godly, is out preaching the good word of the unnamed god. Out of boredom and probably depression, she drinks and drugs herself into borderline blackouts while he's away, having sex with travellers in need of shelter in her mildly delirious state, which really blurs the line of consent. But don't worry, it gets worse. When she does give birth to Elphaba, she has no idea who the father could be. Though she does have a vague memory of a traveling salesman who had a little green bottle that she's now kept as a trinket. When she drank the green elixir, it knocked her out and gave her very vivid dreams. So she can't remember if they did it or not. So in layman's terms, Elphaba was conceived out of that date R word that also rhymes with a fruit. I'm, I'm trying to think of like a show tune you could put that into, but I really can't. And if that wasn't bad enough, when Elphaba is a few years old, a quadling, who are red people who live in the swampy lands of Oz, pops by while Frex is out of town finding himself after being disgraced by a magical animatronic puppet show, which I can't get into right now, otherwise this whole video would be 95 years long, and I'm not filming a 95 year long video on the second time round. They begin having a fervent affair that continues for years, and might have resulted in Elphaba's sister, Nessa Rose's, conception. Nessa is born without arms because their nanny bought some random street drugs from a psychic to keep the baby's skin from being green. Their father also ends up having a long-term affair with the quadling, and that's why he loves Nessa Rose more, because she is likely the product of the two people she loved the most in the world. Elphaba's first word is horrors, and the quadling ends up as a human sacrifice when there's a drought. And that's only 14 percent of the way through the book. Also, Elphaba's mother doesn't die giving birth to Nessa Rose. Elphaba's mother dies giving birth to their brother Shell, who does not exist in the musical. Greetings. Good start. I'm having fun. In the musical, Elphaba arrives at Shiz, a university in Oz, but only because their father wants her to be Nessa's caretaker during their higher education. So a perk of that is that Elphaba also gets a higher education. Otherwise, she just wouldn't get one. Like, this man hates. Elphaba, with a passion, okay? Glinda, currently Garlinda, is on the scene and she is young, dumb, and full of more dumb. She wants to do sorcery, but the unfortunately named Madame Morrible, the headmistress of Shiz, says she doesn't really run that class unless someone spectacular comes along. And that's definitely not Glinda. Whose reputation is so scandalous. How can I express my gratitude? He's distant and moodified. It's dreadful, it is, to have a house fall on you. But accidents will happen. Glinda thinks Madame Morrible didn't even read her essay, which was titled Wands. Need they have a point? When she says this, one of her friends is like, you should say something to her, that's unfair. So she raises her hand just as Madame Morrible is asking who wants to room with Elphaba because her father just forgot to enroll her. <laughs> Oh, Dad, go to therapy. Please go to therapy. For real. And because of that silly miscommunication, they end up being roommates. And Nessa Rose gets put in Madame Morrible's personal chambers to be looked after by her personally, which I think law enforcement should really look into. However, in the book, Girl Linda is on her way to her first day at Crage Hall, the girls' school of shiz, when her nanny, or Arma, who doesn't exist in the musical, by the way, steps on a rusty nail and has to go get treatment so she doesn't get sick, meaning poor Galinda has to brave the first day alone. In the book, she's rather vain, kind of dumb, but nowhere near as unintelligent as in the musical. I don't know why you would need to know that. It's in my script, so I'm just gonna say it, okay? She's vain, but she ain't that dumb. I mean, she's dumb, but like, she's not. Okay, I'm gonna just... This is a mess. 
On the train, she meets Dr. Dillamond, a talking goat, but I'll get to him later. And unfortunately, upon arrival, she finds that the way Shiz's rooming situation is organized is that the rich girls get paired up by their armors in a socially strategic way, meaning Glinda has no one to speak for her. Thus, she is thrust into a room with Elphaba after trying to convince Madame Morrible not to put her in a room with 17 unchaperoned poorer girls. To solidify this, she makes up a lie saying that Armor Clutch has a mental condition in which she will sometimes have episodes of thinking that inanimate objects are people, so she couldn't possibly look over 17 other girls. Remember that lie? For later. In both the musical and the book, Madame Morrible is, as her name may suggest, horrible. The main difference that I want to touch on though is that Madame Morrible has like this weird robot animatronic servant. Its name is Gromitic, which I have always imagined looks like this but in reality it probably looks more akin to the live action version because it's a horrible nightmare that isn't a children's film that's horrible remember him for later okay remember him. i'm gonna have no i'm not how long has it been 40 minutes pause I'm back. I just took a break to get myself some cake that I think might have mold on it, but much like me doing a video on something that I'm not hyper fixated on anymore, I don't care. Let's as ASMR this. Adding value to the platform. That's what I'm doing. Adding value. Oh yeah, that's definitely mold. Definitely mold. All right, let's have a look. Back in the musical, we're introduced to Dr. Dillamont, a goat professor who you might remember from The Train. Well, now he's in his classroom, where Galinda gets mad that Dr. D can't say her name in a way that she would like by essentially saying, you're in America now, learn how to speak American. And then Elphaba gives her anti-racism speech. <laughs> Then Dr. D launches into a lesson and flips over the chalkboard to find that it says animals should be seen and not heard, which isn't great, considering that we soon thereafter find out that animals are having their rights taken away and their voices are mysteriously disappearing. Not good at all really. In the book, we find out that there are animals and then there are animals. The former can talk, the latter cannot. No one knows what gives animals the ability to talk, which is one of the big points in many philosophical conversations in the book. We're introduced to Dr. Dillamond on the train as he's sharing the first class compartment with Galinda, where he pervs on her. Then Galinda is kind of rude to him because he looks sort of shabby, and when he tries to engage her in conversation about <gasps> animals not being allowed on public transport anymore, more because the wizard is segregating them, she's like, mm, that doesn't really affect me. So, you know what I mean? However, he does help Glinda actually reach Shiz as she has no idea what she's doing and looks a little bit helpless. Back in the musical, the next time we see Dr. D is back in class where he's come to say goodbye as animals are no longer permitted to teach in Oz. Before Dr. D can say much more, Madame Morrible rushes in and is like, OMG, I'm so sorry. But rules are rules, okay? Bye-bye. Then she brings in a new teacher with her and two henchmen who drag Dr. D away while he screams. You're not being told the whole story! Which makes me think we might not be getting told the whole story. Him being suspiciously dragged away by two henchmen who look like they're not taking him anywhere good inspires Glinda to change her name to Glinda because that's what he called her. Aww. I really don't see what the problem is. Every other professor seems to be able to pronounce my name. She does this to take us. Ooh, I did that. I did that. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I have watched the Wonka trailer 73 times in the last two months in preparation for seeing Wonka this week. She does this to take a stand, changing oppression one vowel at a time. And I really hope we can see more unity and more peace when already things are so difficult. So shout out to his family. Dr. D's fate is unfortunately unfortunate. In Act 2, we find him voiceless in the wizard's palace, seemingly unable to recognize Elphaba anymore. After growing up with that conclusion of Dr. D's story in the musical, the book 
for this story beat really took me off guard. In the book, he's in the midst of researching what the biological similarities are between animals and humans, hoping to find that they are biologically the same and show his findings to the wizard so he can finally stop segregating the animals and taking their rights away. Near the end of their first summer at Shiz, he begins to get close to proving his hypothesis correct. And then he gets violently murdered. And there was a witness. Yes, this is now a murder mystery. Move over, knives out. Who killed Dr. Dilliman? Turns out, Arma Clutch. Remember Arma Clutch? Glinda's nanny who couldn't come with her to the first day of Shiz, thus landing Glinda in this rooming situation with Elphaba. Well, Arma Clutch saw something weird out of the window when she was putting Glinda and Elphaba to bed. So she broke the one rule of living in a real life horror movie and went down to investigate and never came back. Well, she did, but like not to them. To Madame Morrible, which is sus. Elphaba and Glinda find out via Madame Morrible, sus, that she's in the hospital wing of the school because she had another episode. Also sus. Remember when Glinda made up that lie about Armaclutch not being able to take care of too many people because she had a condition that would make her think that inanimate objects were real people? Well, that's now something she's really experiencing. Why am I, have I not been looking into the camera that whole time? No, let me check that footage. Oh no. It's fine. I was fine. Everything's fine. Sugar makes my ADHD symptoms a lot worse. So I've put the moldy cake down. Anyway, let's keep going. I don't remember where I was. Where was I? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Madame Morrible being horrible. So Madame Morrible is the only person who knew about this lie that Glinda had told. And now this is actually something that Arma Clutch is really experiencing. So as I was reading this book, I started to wonder, perhaps the woman whose last name is one letter off from horrible. Could she have something to do with this? Well, unfortunately, the condition ends up killing Arma Clutch in the end. But on Arma Clutch's deathbed, Glinda, now Glinda, after Dr. D's death, has chosen sorcery as her major and isn't bad at it. She casts a spell on Arma Clutch, which breaks her out of her delusions for just a few moments. Just enough time to tell the girls who murdered Dr. Dillamond. Any guesses? It was grommetic. <laughs> yes, Madame Morrible's horrible or fun looking robot animatronic thing servant, depending on how you remember him. I personally remember him as the henchman. He was the one to slit the goat's throat. Well, now that we've solved that crime, how are we only on chapter four? I feel like this angle is terrible. I've taken my medication, so let's hope this goes better. We can't talk about Miss Nessa Rose without talking about Bach in the musical Now Can We? A quick refresher. In the musical, Elphaba's sister Nessa Rose is in a wheelchair because their father fed too many flowers to their mother during pregnancy, which made Nessa Rose come early and their mother die during childbirth. Elphaba only ends up going to Shiz because of Nessa needing someone to look after her. Their father is the mayor of Munchkinland and Nessa is next in line for the title purely based on the fact that Nessa is daddy's favorite. Great, all caught up. Now Bach. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not a Bok apologist. I'm not a Bok stan. I wish I could stand on Bok's throat and kill him. <laughs> I don't like Bok. In the musical, he has a pretty extreme crush on Glinda. So extreme, in fact, that when Glinda is infatuated with another character, who I'll get to soon, don't worry, she tries to fend off his advances by telling him that whoever would ask Nessa Rose out would be her hero. Which is a weird way of putting it. But because he's the worst, that's exactly what he does. And he pretends to like her for far too long. At the end of Act 1, it's implied that he does actually tell her the truth about why he asked her out in the first place to impress Glinda. But in act two, the law in the musical gets a little bit foggy here. Nessa has become the mayor of Munchkinland because her father has died and Bok is her butler, forced lover. I don't know, but he's there. He's always there. Apparently she's a bit of a tyrant and has been stripping Munchkins of their rights so that she can keep Bok closer to her, which I will give Bok one point there. That kind of sucks. One day Elphaba rocks up after years of not seeing Nessa and gives her the power to walk via a magic shoe spell. Nessa is so excited she calls for Bok, who is, turns out, still obsessed with Glinda and is like, yay, now that you can walk, you probably won't need me as much anymore so I can finally go and confess my feelings for Glinda again. Sure. Sure, she's engaged and throwing in an engagement ball right now, but this seems like a really good time. 
So that's what I'm gonna go do. Nessa then loses it and reads from Elphaba's book of spells, but she doesn't know what she's reading, so she accidentally shrinks Box Heart, meaning Elphaba has to save him with another spell. For hurting the man she loves, Nessa dubs herself the Wicked Witch of the East. The spell Elphaba uses turns Bok into the Tin Man, because then he won't need a heart. And yes, that is the Tin Man's origin story in the musical, which doesn't make any sense if you've read the original Wizard of Oz books, or you've heard any of the dialogue from the Tin Man in the Wizard of Oz movie. But that's fine. I don't care. I love this musical. I'm already, I'm too taken away by the theatrical spectacle that I am in the theatre witnessing. So I don't really think about that stuff, but you might. Now, a quick refresher of Nessa in the book. She's the potential love child of the quadling and her mother's affair and was born with no arms because her nanny fed her mother some random street drugs from a sidekick to keep her skin from being green. Great. All caught up. Unlike the musical where Elphaba is only getting an education because Nessa is, Nessa doesn't enter the picture at Shiz until after Dr. D's death when Armaclutch goes cuckoo. She's given the magic shoes as a gift from her father, just like the musical, but it's Glinda, not Elphaba, who spells them many years later once she becomes the mayor of Munchkinland, seven years after she graduates from Shiz. A title she receives when a relative passes away, not her father. He's a minister, remember? Elphaba has the right to the title, but she's kind of off the rails at this point and definitely doesn't want during a visit to see her sister when she is the mayor of Munchkinland, Elphaba witnesses her use sorcery to bargain with an old woman who asks for her help. Said woman comes in to have an audience with Nessa Rose about her maid falling in love with a woodcutter and said maid wanting to leave her post to go and marry him. The woman offers Nessa her animals with a capital A. Yes, we have unfortunately reached slavery. So naturally, Elphaba's like, that's fucked. But Nessa is like, what do you want me to do? And the woman says, I brought you his axe. I thought you might be witch it and cause it to kill him. Which is a bit extreme, and Nessa thinks so as well, because she says, well, that wouldn't be very nice, but she does it anyway, saying that she'll just bewitch the axe to lop off one of his limbs, and then hopefully the maid won't love him anymore. So the woman says, sick, thanks. And if that doesn't work, can I come back, you you do that again and lop off more of his limbs for the same price of three sentient beings? To which Nessa agrees. Thus, the Tin Man was born. His axe lopped off all his limbs and had them replaced by a tin maker. And this is actually how it happened in the original Wizard of Oz book series. Children's stories were just really written differently in the early 1900s. Bok, on the other hand, in the novel, never asks Nessa Rose out. He is unfortunately still wildly obsessed with Glinda, though. So much so that when we first see things from his perspective, he's climbed up onto the roof of a stable next to the girls' college of Shiz and tries to find Glinda in the windows to see her undress. <laughs> he's the worst. He ends up falling into Shiz's garden patch because Elphaba caught him and yelled up at him and was like, hey, what's going on there? What you doing? Hmm? What's happening? What's going on? He's like, I love, I love Glinda so much. Can you please facilitate a, a, a meeting between her and I? I need to confess my feelings to her. And when Elphaba does so, because she thinks his infatuation is hilarious, he staunchly refuses to take Glinda's rejection. Well, I might be all or none of the things you say, but you will learn that I am a persistent. I will not let you say no to our friendship, Galinda. It means too much to me. He's really just nice guying his way through it in the worst way. At one point, he even invites himself to a summer house that Glinda is staying at. Elphaba gets fake invited by one of Glinda's shitty friends and is like, oh, you definitely have to go. I'll come too. I know you didn't invite me. Glinda didn't invite me. No one invited me, but I'll come too. You don't even have to ask. You don't even have to ask. No one f***ing asked, Bok. No one. And then, and this is the worst bit, Glinda and him end up kissing at the summer house. I'm gonna be honest here. If Gregory Maguire showed up to my house, knocked on my door, I opened the door and he just spat in my eye without even saying hello, I would have felt less disrespected than I did reading that story beat personally. But that's just me. You know, I'm quirky. I'm not like the other girls. Then the second that Glinda starts thinking for herself and having a few mental health struggles because she may or may not have caused her nanny to have some kind of strange mental condition where she talks to inanimate objects, he's just kind of like, no thanks, not dealing with that. I'm good. Like, he's literally the worst. He's the worst. I'm sorry, but you can't convince me otherwise. I don't know. Like, let's... 
let's fight it out on the no let's not fight it out on the street if you like bok it's really good for you and i'm really happy but lucky for me we find out what happens to bok after shiz he marries one of glinda's friends and she hates her life with him so much that she consistently tries to off herself and then he writes about her attempts in each and every yearly holiday letter that he sends out to all of his old friends from shiz happy holidays everybody Box letters here. I would dread getting that letter every year. I see why the Tin Man was was a better storyline, full circle moment than the sad wife thing. How did I get lipstick on my leg? But Hulk kiss anyone? All right, I'm gonna give you the spark notes of this, right? You know the Emerald City. You saw the Wizard of Oz growing up. I saw the Wizard of Oz growing up. We all saw the Wizard of Oz growing up, okay? The Emerald City in the musical is kind of the same way it is in the Wizard of Oz movie. Very green, very fun. When Elphaba and Glinda meet the wizard, they find out that he's just some guy and that Madame Marble is now part of his government. Blah, 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 Madame Marble and the wizard trick Elphaba into magicking monkeys that he keeps in his office like a psychopath to have wings. She, then she's like, this is wrong, and defies gravity. And then Glinda and Elphaba leave on good terms. La, 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 la. Then Idina Menzel wins a Tony. However, in the novel, Glinda and Elphaba go to the Emerald City after Madame Morrible corners them and Nessa Rose at Armor Clutch's wake to try to recruit them into the wizard's army. After which Elphaba is like, something is super weird here. Let's go confront it. And Glinda is just kind of dragged along. But because of political train track stuff, it takes them over a week to get there. And when they do, they only get a four minute meeting between two other meetings, so been anticlimactic. When they do get there, it's not really a fun city and they see a bunch of slums on the outskirts, which kind of kills the vibe a little bit. Because yuck, people who are systematically oppressed, ew. Unlike the musical, they don't see who's behind the illusion, which in the novel is a skeleton made of lightning on a throne under a storm. But when Alphaba offers up Dr. D's research to show him that animals deserve just as many rights as humans, he's like, doesn't matter to me, I thought Dr. Dillamond was a quack. I'm glad I'm taking all the animals' rights away. I'm straight up racist. After that letdown, Elphaba decides she's going to stay in the city and defy the wizard, so she's not going back with Glinda. Now, we may not get defying gravity, but we do get a gay moment. You'll be all right, Elphaba said. Now you're a seasoned traveler. This is just the return leg of a voyage you already know. She put her face against Glinda's and kissed her. Hold out if you can, she murmured, and kissed her again. The driver clucked the reins and pitched a cry to leave. For all her singularity of complexion, it was astounding how quickly she became camouflaged in the ragamuffin variety of street life in the Emerald City. Or maybe it was the foolish tears blurring Glinda's vision. Elphaba hadn't cried, of course. Her head had turned away quickly as she stepped down. Not to hide her tears, but to soften the fact of their absence. But the sting to Glinda was real. Slay! In the later books of the Wicked series, it becomes apparent that for Glinda, that song, What Is This Feeling, uh, is in fact not about her loathing Elphaba. Cute. Oh I'm sweating so badly, holy shit. Anyway, back in the musical, Fiero is a winky prince and the local sl- <laughs> My script does say love interest, but there's nothing wrong with being a good old you know? Is a good word, only to be used by women and gay people. I, lie. I don't see it as a bad word. Do you know who made it a bad word? Men. And who are we not respecting? Men. Okay, let's get back to it, shall we? Both Glinda and Elphaba both have dalliances with Fiero. He arrives at Shiz, pompous, rich, and arrogant. He and Glinda are hot and popular, so they start dating, but he low-key has the hots for Elphaba. One day, he and Elphaba are in class, the same day that Dr. D gets taken away and replaced by a new teacher. This teacher brings out a lion cub and is like, look at this cool new thing called a cage that we can keep all the animals in. Don't worry, the lion cub's not scared. Okay, he's just really excited. Or maybe he is terrified because I've got a huge f needle here. Naturally, Elphaba freaks out and magics everyone to have sick dance moves except for herself and Fiero, who steals the lion cub and sets it free in the wild. And then they touch hands and it is fraught with sexual tension. Later, he brings flowers to the train station just before she leaves for the Emerald City and says he thinks about that day with the lion cub a lot. <laughs> yeah. While in front of his girlfriend, Glinda, back in the novel, Fiero is still a winky prince, but he's quiet and reserved and 
nothing really like the musical at all, actually. He's married at age seven to another child bride who will not end up seeing him again until they're 20 to start a family and settle down. That's part of his culture, especially as a prince. In the book, he's actually introduced after Dr. Dilliman dies when he almost gets killed by a pair of flying antlers, which I'm not going to explain. This video is going to be so long as it is, you can just try to work out what that means and in what context that could have potentially happened. Much like the musical, the new teacher brings in a lion cub, but the intentions here are very obviously horrible and are very specific. The teacher basically wants to perform an experiment on the lion cub to see if they can find the point in the brain that stops the animals from learning to talk at all. Because as babies or cubs, you can't actually tell if they're animals or animals, which is pretty messed up. The entire class is kind of like, no, dude, that's that's too far. It's not just Alphaba, which is which is nice, you know? Nice that she's not the only one who's like, probably shouldn't do that to living beings, yeah? And then two random girls from the class take the lion cub out and rescue it. It's not Fiero and Alphaba like in the musical. In fact, Fiero and Alphaba don't really have a ton of one-on-one -on -one contact during Shiz at all. It's only in a friendship group hangout context. But let's go back to the musical, because now it's act two and it's five years later. Fiero is now the head of the wizard's hunt for Elphaba and engaged to Glinda. That is until Elphaba sneaks back into the wizard's palace to free the monkeys she accidentally spelled to have wings. The wizard finds her first and talks her into an alliance before she finds Dr. D covered by a sheet, unable to speak and seemingly cannot recognize her anymore. So she flies off the handle again. Fiero finds her with the rest of the guard who are under his command. But instead of incarcerating her, he defends her and points Points his big gun at the wizard instead. Then Glinda shows up and he's like, what the hell is going on? OMG, Alphabar, mwah, mwah. oh my God, it's been so long. What's new with you? Oh my God, it's been so many years. Like what's happening in your life? I'm engaged. What are you? What's, ha what, what's happening? And Fiero is like, yeah, I'm actually in love with her. And I have been since she's. I know we've had like a five year long relationship <laughs> or whatever, but. I'm gonna go with her, okay? I'm gonna go with her. So he goes with her and they sing the song as long as you're mine in what I think is a swamp where they have sexual intercourse. In the novel, it's around five years later as well and Elphaba is now part of a mysterious act of activist group for animal rights. Don't know why I said it like that, I'm so sorry. Fiero runs into her at a church, of all places, ironically at a statue of a saint named Glinda. She tries to give him the slip, but he's not dumb and realizes she'll probably go out the back. He follows her to her dilapidated department where they end up hanging out. At this point, Fiero is the ruler of his land, the Vincus, and he's in the Emerald City on business. He's got three kids with that wife that he married when he was seven, and he likes them just fine. However, after hanging out a few times, he and Elphaba stuff. My script says he and Elphaba begin sleeping together and falling in love, but I have nothing left to give. He justifies it by being like, Well, I have been faithful to my wife all this time, even though she has offered me her sisters to sleep with. But being with Elphaba makes me love her more. Yeah. Yeah. The morals of Oz are also not really explored in this book. Is cheating that bad? Because everyone seems to be cheating. Alphaba's mother cheated, Alphaba's father cheated, Fiero cheated, the wizard cheated the system. Like, I'm confused. I'm just... I'm just a girl. All right. You just keep live, laugh, loving, Fiero. You just, you just keep on living. You keep on living, laughing. Living, laughing, loving, laughing. Living. Back in the musical, after Alphaba sees a vision of her sister getting hit by Dorothy's house, she rushes to her side to find her already dead. Glinda has given Dorothy the shoes her father gave Nessa, and they begin having the iconic cat fight that always finds itself into promos whenever the musical comes to town. The wizard's guards show up and separate the women, threatening to take Alphaba to the wizard until Fierro swings by. He says he'll shoot Glinda in the face. <laughs> Just, I don't know why. It sounds so stupid. It's not funny. Gun violence isn't funny, okay? Fiero says he'll shoot Glinda in the face unless they let go of Elphaba, which they obviously do. Unfortunately, he then has to give himself up because he doesn't actually want to shoot Glinda in the face and the guards accost him and torture him for information on Elphaba. So the song No Good Deed comes in and she calls herself the Wicked Witch of the West trying to save Fiero by turning him into the Scarecrow. And now he can never die unless he catches on fire and then he's f***ed. And then at the end of the show, when Alphaba fakes her death, he comes back as a scarecrow and they run away together. In the book, 
think about how this is going to end. Any predictions? Let's just say it's not about the Wicked Witch of the West running away with her scarecrow boyfriend. Elphaba asks Fiera to stay away from her house for two weeks because she's about to do some mysterious animal activist stuff. He pretends to agree but follows her through the city where he sees her prepare to murder Madame Morrible. However, for some reason there are a bunch of school children around her, meaning Elphaba cannot strike unless she wants to kill the children as well. And unfortunately, she still has a moral compass at this point. So as she drifts into the crowd, Fierro loses sight of Elphaba, so he heads back to her apartment even though she warned him not to. As he begins to cook dinner in her apartment, the wizard's guard, aka the Gale Force, yes, that is what they are called, because Gale Force wins and Dorothy Gale is fun. Is it? Well, they beat him to death. So also no one no one finds his body. His body is just never recovered. So there's that as well. Dorothy hasn't even arrived at that point. She's almost a decade off. We're only halfway through the book. The idea that Fiero might be the scarecrow the way that he is in the musical is born out of this period of time near the end of her life, Elphaba's life, where she's not really having a great time. Right? She wanders out into the world and tries to murder Madame Morrible again, but by the time she gets there, Morrible has already passed away in her bed from an unrelated illness. So Elphaba beats Morrible's corpse's skull in with one of her trophies that's inscribed with in appreciation of everything you have done, which is poetic. On the same day, she also finds out that the wizard, the man that she literally hates more than anyone in the world, is her father. How does she find out, you may ask? Well, of course, it's the magic traveling animatronic puppet show. You are the father! But I'm not going to explain once again because this video is getting too long. It's just kind of the worst day ever. You know what I mean? Like, you try to kill someone, they're already dead. You are just wandering around a park, a little bit drunk after dinner, get accosted by a magical animatronic puppet show. Turns out your dad is actually a massive tyrant. It's just... I mean, I would also think that my boyfriend who got beaten to death by my dad's guard and whose body was never found was also a scarecrow, okay? I probably would as well. I can't judge. Elphaba's kind of losing the plot a bit. She's not really sleeping. Dorothy's being commissioned by the wizard to, like, come kill her, so she's, like, constantly on the lookout. Um, And when she does see them, she tells her little animal friendos, hey, can you decapitate him and just see if Fierro's face is, like, underneath a scarecrow mask? So the animals do do that. Turns out he's just straw. Fierro's definitely not the scarecrow in the book which is kind of it's kind of sad just means he got beaten to death and then his body was hidden it's just a horrible way to go oh no there's more oh god okay do you care about kiamoko no one cares about kiamoko and the magic but i'm gonna tell you anyway how exciting kiamoko is the place in the wizard of oz where the witch is always seen it's also the place in the musical where elphaba pretends to get melted and fiero comes back as the scarecrow to retrieve her and live their lives together and that storyline is backed up with the wizard of oz's infamous dialogue of you cursed brat look what you've done i'm melting melting what a world what a world. Who would have thought a good little girl like you could destroy my beautiful wickedness? Look out. Look out. I'm going. Oh. Oh. Look me in the fucking eye, okay? Did you really think she was dead with a performance like that? Kiamo Ko in the novel is Fierro's widow's and his children's home. Elphaba travels to it with her maybe Fierro love child to confess her sins to his widow. Which, you know, maybe keep that guilt to yourself. Which could have been a really interesting tension point in the book. But she just takes Elphaba in straight away. Even though she low-key knows that she was doing the deed with her husband. And it's also kind of in the book she kind of has powers but like not really. Like um, sort of. Like there's a few instances where she may or may not. Like mm, there was this time where one of Fierro's children is definitely most likely a psychopath and hurts Elphaba's love child like multiple times throughout the story. So one winter's day, she's thinking about what a dickhead the kid is and then coincidentally, an icicle impales him right through his skull. Ugh, hate that. 
hate when that happens, when you manifest too hard. Also, I think she was thinking about weapons as well, so that probably didn't help. Okay, this is going to be less than the Sparks Notes version of this. In The Wizard of Oz, Elphaba dies. In Wicked the Musical, Elphaba lives. In Wicked the Book, like the Wizard of Oz movie, she dies. Elphaba's dead. In my original script, that part was 10 minutes long. Don't know why I needed 10 minutes to explain that. The only other thing you need to know is that Elphaba was allergic to water. And no, it is not explained in the book. That's just, it's just the way it is in the book. I love a flat Diet Coke from McDonald's. This is six hours old. I ordered it with no ice and intended it to have it and what? The wizard. The finale. Ugh, the wizard's backstory. Listen. Okay. The wizard in The Wicked Musical is this charismatic guy who kind of got carried away by people calling him wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. They call me wonderful. That, that one. That song. That's, yeah, banger. He, he, he says, right, that he wants the best for Oz, but mm, I don't know about that. He got blown to Oz via hot air balloon on complete accident. And he's where Dorothy came from. So, like our world still don't really know how that universe kind of works he painted the animals as the bad guys and like you know he overall he's actually not a very good guy but in the musical he's kind of painted as like a f nice guy he's just he's just like oh sorry i went crazy with power and got a little bit racist you know that's kind of his character in the musical linda just tells him to like f off and get in his little balloon and go away and then Madame Marble gets sent to jail. I mean, I guess in this version of the story, she hasn't died and had her corpse beaten in by Elphaba in a trophy. I wouldn't want to see that on stage. But after Elphaba fakes her death, Linda shows him the green bottle that Elphaba kept as a reminder of her mother, showing him that Elphaba was his daughter the whole time. And that breaks his heart because he always longed to be a father. However, in the novel, he comes to Oz on purpose to follow the Grimmery, which is the exact same thing as it is in the musical, just a magical book of spells. When he arrives in Oz, he's just a snake soil salesman, just scams and scams for a living. And that's around the time that Elphaba was also conceived, right? So he's got his green little elixirs and he's like, seeking out the drink, you green elixir. But it's, you know, R wordy. So it's not not really like the musical. And then he used his conning and scamming to essentially overthrow the rightful queen who was a baby at the time by giving her to a witch who then makes her into a little boy. Yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> that genuinely, that is what happens in the original Wizard of Oz book series. That is what the wizard did to gain power. And also the wizard is Irish, but... You know, does anyone care? We find out that he's Irish via Elphaba's dreams after she drinks a little bit of the green elixir that her mother drank during the conception. So the wizard in the novel never finds out that Elphaba is his child, but Elphaba does find out that she is his daughter. But in the musical, she never knows that he is her daughter and he knows that she is his daughter. Okay, got it? Good, because I'm not saying that again. In these dreams, she also has a vision of him drowning himself trying to br nope have another drink she also finds out through these dreams that he tried to drown himself so he also publicly executes Fierro's family like straight up one day Elphaba's out of the house la, 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 la. and then she comes back and finds like the entire family gone she's like what's going on finds out a while later that, that the wizard just like publicly executed them all he's a psychopath he's awful he doesn't deserve a song at all I would say that he's also just a victim of the patriarchy but I think he's just a dickhead oh it's over oh I can edit this oh my god if you sat through this thank you very much if you didn't also, thank you very much. Uh, love you. In conclusion, the novel is much darker than the musical. And I'm brain dead. Filming this video for a second time for longer? This took me longer than the first time. And I had three outfit changes in the first one. Just started getting a ringing in my ear. Am I dying? And I'm not even in my hyperfixated state anymore. The Oz universe was a massive hyperfixation. I love poking holes in things and like ruining things for myself. It's one of my favorite pastimes. I just finished The Phantom of the Opera and holy shit, that's not sexy. That book is the furthest thing from sexy, okay? Okay, you okay, will not be attracted to the Phantom after reading that book. Okay, girly pops? Because I know that's a big thing, all right? Although I did watch the actual musical the other day and there's this scene where the Phantom's like on the floor, like 
on his hands and knees, like running around like a health, help, healthless, no, helpless, pathetic dog. And I thought, I could, I could. Am I attracted to that? La 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 la. Okay, uh, I apologize for putting this into the algorithm. Okay, thank you. Please subscribe. <laughs>